Okay, hi everyone. We're gonna go ahead and get started. Welcome, my name is Brooke Christensen and I'm a PhD student in the Daily Lab in the Department of Ecology and Evolutionary Biology at the University of California, Irvine. I'm happy to welcome you to another in a series of workshops on integrative organismal modeling of movement. These workshop ha workshops have been sponsored by the NSF Division of Organismal Systems with the goal of bringing together scientists across disciplines at the intersection of organismal biology and physics. We really aim to highlight the use of model-based and mathematical tools to address fundamental questions in organismal biology. These workshops, just as a reminder, and like always, will be recorded and shared as an open access online resource hosted through the UCI Center for Integrative Movement Sciences with the School of Biological Sciences. And with that, thank you all very much for your attention, and please welcome today's workshop speakers, whom I will let introduce each other. Thank you. All right, thank you very much, Brooke. Um, hey, everyone, uh, my name is Chris Martinez, and I'm a assistant professor at UC Irvine, and I'll be uh, chairing the session today. Um, so uh, when I first saw uh, who was included in the, the list of speakers for the session, I thought, oh yeah, that, that makes sense. It's, all, it's a group of people who are all interested in morphology, function, or both. Um, but was, what was I, I was kind of surprised to find out is how different each of our research programs really were. Um, we're all asking very different types of questions uh, using different tools uh, and approaches to address them. Um, but I think that's uh, gonna be a strength of the lineup that we have today. Um, and it's really gonna result in a nice variety of talks that I hope will match the, the diverse interests um, of the audience. So uh, we're gonna start with the presentation by Aki Watanabe from uh, the New York Institute of Technology. Um, and he'll talk about 3D shape analysis with geometric morphometrics. And uh, this will be followed by a talk by me um, using uh, a morphometric application for studying motion diversity. And uh, next, uh, Armida Manostada uh, from Yale University will tell us about joint mobility as a bridge between form and function. And then we'll round out the talks um, with Mike Rambo from Queens University, who's gonna talk about uh, coupling statistical shape uh, modeling to joint mechanics. Um, and so one quick note before we get going. Um, so our talks are going to be scheduled for 15 minutes each. So each, um, uh, so if a speaker ends early, we'll take questions for a couple minutes, but I'm going to try to um, stay on schedule, sort of, uh, at least. <laughs> so uh, I encourage you all to either write your questions in the Q&A during the talk uh, so we have time to see them, or uh, you can raise your hands uh, after the talk. And any questions that we don't have time to answer um, will get revisited during the panel discussion after the last talk. So um, with that, I'm gonna um, hand it off to Aki. Thanks, Chris. And uh, let me... And then I will share, there we go, that should work, all right. All right, so yeah, thank you for, um, uh, thanks for the introduction, Chris. And then, yeah, thanks to organizers for inviting me to um, uh, be part of this session. Um, and thanks for the participants who are joining us. So um, back to my title slide. So um, full disclosure, I'm not a biomechanist or you know, a strict functional anatomist. Um, so um, my expertise lies in quantifying, analyzing shape. Uh, so these are biological shapes. Um, and so I titled this talk, um, like I do with some of my other talks recently, as uh, building a phenomic universe. So what do I mean by that? Well, a phenome means an organism's sum total, um, you know, of its organism's phenotype. So um, I envision this phenotypic uh, phenomic universe as sort of a metaphor, extended metaphor, for all the morphological data that all of us are collecting together across different taxa, across deep time. Um, and so today in my presentation, I'm going to give a brief overview of, you know, some of the techniques that you can use uh, to quantify and analyze biological forms. And so what's been exciting uh, in this century is this advancements in imaging modalities. Um, so that includes computer tomography or CT, MRI. You also have microscopy um, where, you know, microscopes that can take Z-stack images at very high resolutions. 
And you also have surface scans um, that's become really portable and pretty affordable in the last uh, decade or so. And so you're able to take these scanners to various places like natural history uh, museums and collections and get really rich data. And so these are kind of types of data you can kind of expect from these modalities. Um, so again, you get this really wealth, uh, a wealth of these uh, morphological uh, data very rapidly. So it's a very exciting time. And when it comes to analyzing uh, morphological data, you know, a lot of times these um, rich data are kind of converted into, for example, a set of linear distance measurements, for example, caliper measurements or size measurements like volume. Uh, and if you're, um, you know, phylogeneticists, you might collect uh, and score characters, morphological characters for phylogenetic analyses. And all these are very valuable uh, ways of quantifying morphology, uh, no doubt about it. Um, but I also feel like we're not taking a full advantage of this rich morphological data that we are able to collect using modern imaging technologies. And so what we want to do is try to um, be able to capture the kind of the overall shape of an organism or any structures uh, and then be able to model it. And this has a, um, a long history. So a seminal work by Darcy Thompson uh, over hundred years ago, uh, which is his seminal work titled On Growth and Form, uh, was, uh, has this kind of origination of this idea of how do we start mathematically describing morphology? And what's been exciting in you know, this century for sure, but um, there's this longstanding field of what's called geometric morph metrics. Um, and, otherwise known as statistical shape analysis. And so this slide kind of highlights some of the modern techniques that you can use to quantify shape and kind of um, apply what kind of Darcy Thompson was thinking all those years ago. And so for my work, um, yeah, this is the field that I, or the, the uh, methods or approach I use, which is called geometric morph metrics. And it typically uh, involves collection of a set of coordinate points. So here, I'm using it on uh, one of the studies that I was involved with, trying to quantify the shape of uh, the brain of birds. So this one in particular is an ostrich. And again, you can use a set of 3D or even 2D coordinates to quantify the overall shape of, of their brain morphology. And what you can do is apply a whole bunch of multivariate techniques to investigate a wide range of biological questions. Um, and so, one that could be familiar to a lot of you in the audience is these morphous space diagrams where each point represents a specimen. And so in this case, it's still that avian brain data set. And so uh, each data, uh, data point represents a brain uh, model. And if they're farther away from each other, that means that they're more um, different in shape. And then the closer that they are, means they resemble each other more closely. And the lines indicate their phylogenetic relationship. So you can make these morphous space or what's more specifically called phylomorphous space uh, to visualize the variation in um, phenotype. And what's also powerful about geometric morphometric methods is that you can model and test um, how certain factors or variables uh, are associated with shape. Uh, and these could be functional variables um, and, or like environmental factors or any other variables that you're collecting alongside uh, these phenotypic data. And what you can do is run a standard kind of multivariate regression analysis to statistically test how certain effects, in this case, like how does the size of the brain um, associated with the shape of the brain. Um, and you can also model and so these are kind of simple wireframe diagrams, uh, but you can, yeah, visualize, intuitively visualize um, how the shape of the brain across birds changes depending on uh, the size of the animal. And so there are uh, several software now that, uh, and options that you can use to collect these type of data. Um, so there's TPSDIG, uh, which is part of the Stony Brook Morphometrics group uh, headed by um, Jim Rolf. Um, there's also Slicer 3D um, and the Slicer Morph extension as part of the package within Slicer 3D uh, that allows you to collect uh, landmark data. And that's gonna be what we're gonna be using in the, uh, work the second workshop that um, the part of it that I'll be leading next week. 
Uh, and then there's also a software called Landmark Editor, which is technically free, but it's been discontinued for a while. And then kind of the low cost subscription version is Stradivant Checkpoint. Um, and I've been involved, uh, especially during my postdoc in developing kind of these high density geometric morphometric um, methods. And what this allows is it, it takes a little bit of time and uh, effort and bunch of code, but as you can see, you know, you can, first delineate each bone um, that make up the skull. Uh, and then you can use a template to project a um, bunch of coordinate points onto the surface within each of the regions that you've delimited. So this is a powerful way of robustly characterizing the components that make up a structure, a uh, complex phenotype like the skull. And using this method, we can actually start to look at association or covariation between different partitions that make up the skull. And so what these kind of techniques allow you to do is, uh, so the two main systems that I primarily work on in my research program is uh, brains and then skulls on the right. And so you can yeah, collect a rich morphometric data that I think reflects the, the rich phenotypic or imaging data that we're, we're able to collect with scanners. And just to go briefly about like how this all works. So this is all um, this landmark based method and the typical paradigm we use is called Procrustes alignment. Um, and this is based on the kind of Greek mythology where Procrustes who is a, a bandit um, kind of uh, uh, cuts people's limbs off or you know, stretches and squeezes people in order to um, have them fit onto an iron bed. And so this alignment protocol um, moves uh, these coordinate data around and stretches them, rescales them, so that you're able to compare and extract shape data from um, these coordinate data you're collecting. So just to use a simple example how this all works. So let's say you're just trying to characterize a bunch of cubes or rectangular prisms. And so you, have, you know, measure points, X, Y, Z coordinates um, from different cubes. And these cubes are going to be unaligned because you've been taking them at you know, not a standard way, for example. Let's say these cubes are just lying on your desk and you're collecting X, Y, Z data from them. Um, so obviously these cubes are not gonna be comparable in terms of you know, how different are they in shape. Um, so we go through this Procrustes alignment, which first involves centering everything based on their center of mass. And then rescaling them so they, um, they have a, a common uh, size. And usually in practice, it's, um, we use unit centroid size of one to rescale all the, the specimens or cubes that you've um, collected. And then finally you adjust for orientation so that you're minimizing the distance between corresponding uh, coordinate points. And so what you're left with, so the small deviations that you're left with in X, Y, Z uh, coordinates uh, at each landmark, that describes uh, mathematically the shape differences. And so you can then run statistical analysis on these new uh, aligned coordinate data. And, and just to give you a real example, empirical data sets. So this is from my master's work looking at um, crocodilian skull shape. So these are sort of the landmarks. This is the landmark scheme I used. Um, and this is the unaligned coordinate data. So it's basically kind of random because I went all around different museums and then collected you know, X, Y, Z coordinate points uh, from a bunch of different specimens. After Procrustes alignment, you can see that it looks more like a skull where the anterior kind of the snout is towards uh, the left side and we were looking at it dorsally. Um, and so all the different variation that you see now um, it are the actual shape differences. Um, and so this is what the Procrustes alignment allows you to do is extract the biologically relevant shape uh, differences uh, from kind of randomly oriented and scaled um, uh, specimen, a uh, coordinate data you've collected from the specimens. And just to finish up, I'm gonna talk about, you know, some of the things that you could do with this data. I'm using kind of my own examples. Um, so uh, with this, Proc data set, what I did was, yeah, first of all, create a morpher space on the left, showing how um, skulls differ from each other across 10 different species of modern extant crocodilians. Um, and I sampled onto next series. So what I did on the right is to 
you know, model how the skull shape changes as um, an individual grows in size within each of these 10 species. And what I did in the end is to test whether the way in which um, the skull shape changes through development has any like, final phylogenetic information. Can we use this information to try and infer uh, phylogenetic relationships? Uh, and the, the kind of the TLDR of that is like, no, uh, at least not in crocodilians. Um, the more recent work that I've done is, yeah, this squamate reptile skull shape data set from my postdoc, uh, where, yeah, we quantified 13 different partitions on the skull. Um, and what you can do is, um, my background is in evolutionary biology, so you can um, create these rate trees where we map the estimated rates of skull shape evolution onto a time calibrated tree. Uh, so we've um, use kind of the temperature scales, so the warmer the colors, the faster that the skull is evolving in those lineages. And on the right, we can also color the um, individual landmarks to show like which regions of the skull are evolving very quickly or very slowly, which are the cooler colors, and yeah, which tend to show, you know, higher variation. And my penultimate slide is sort of a busy slide, so sorry to kind of end it with a big table. Um, this is just to show, you know, you can run standard multivariate uh, regression analyses to look at, you know, whether diet, habitat, locomotion mode, or reproductive mode um, correlate significantly uh, in, what, in, in, in what way to each of the skull parts that we quantify. And um, this is comparing between kind of the paraphyletic lizard group to snakes. And you can see that, for example, if you look at the diet, which is the first column, uh, different um, parts of the skull are um, sort of associated with diet between lizards and snakes. And that might be part of the story as to why lizards and snakes have fundamentally different cranial architecture. And so that's it in terms of the overview of how you can use these kind of high density or landmark based geometric morphometric techniques, uh, hopefully on, on your own data sets. So, you know, I would like to end it by saying, hey, let's keep continuing to expand our phenomic universe, adding more taxa, adding more data sets, adding more you know, anatomical regions. And so with that, um, Chris, I don't know if I have a couple more minutes for questions, but uh, thanks for listening. And then if not right now, I'd be happy to take questions um, in the panel discussion stage. Okay. Ah, this is an involved question. So maybe um, I can, I'll start typing up the answer, but I'll be happy to answer this question in the panel discussion as well, because it's, uh, I, I can spend, it'll take a little bit of time to answer it. All right, so I'll go ahead and get started then. Um, all right, one second. All right, well, thank you all for coming. Um, I'm excited to tell you about my research. Uh, that uses a geometric approach to study uh, the evolution of complex motions. And I probably don't have to tell this audience, but there are so many ways um, or so many different diverse uh, animal motions. Uh, and many of these are vital to fundamental life functions like eating or capturing prey. Um, and uh, uh, they could also be used for en enigmatic behaviors like running on water or intimidating a competitor with a ridiculous jaw umbrella. Uh, but one of the things that these types of motions and so many others have in common is that they rely on semi-independently um, moving parts that work in concert, um, like you see in this fish jaw. Um, this is a system that you'll quickly find uh, during this talk that I'm pretty obsessed with. Uh, and these complex morphologies can produce complex motions uh, and spectacular movements like the prey capture you see here. And uh, these sorts of uh, connections between form and function are what drive my research interests um, with this goal of understanding motion diversity in the context of uh, ecology and adaptive evolution. Um, and it's this interest in the variation in motion attributes that I'll be focusing on today. Um, and uh, I'm gonna uh, advocate for this approach using landmark-based morphometrics I think is particularly well-suited to this type of work. Uh, so in the last talk, uh, Aki did a really great job of describing geometric morphometrics, so I'm gonna be really brief here. Um, we start by assigning landmarks or 
uh, homologous anatomical loci to images, um, often specimens varying in their size and orientation, uh, and during um, a shape alignment uh, called generalized progressives analysis, uh, we scale the landmark configurations to a common size, translate them to the same location, and then rotate them to reduce the landmark distances across specimens. Um, and so this, this analysis, uh, like you saw in Aki's talk, is, is typically used to study non-moving morphologies, uh, like, uh, for example, the head shapes, uh, head shapes image in a standardized position. Um, of course, I'm interested in motion and not just uh, static morphological variation. So uh, here's an example where I use 10 fixed landmarks in blue um, that could be identified to a single point location. Um, and eight sliding semi landmarks um, are distributed uh, at equal distances along the yellow dotted line to capture the curvature along the bottom of the head. Uh, and here's what uh, they look like in motion uh, as this fish rapidly expands its feeding apparatus to generate suction and capture its prey. So in this framework, uh, the motion is represented by this series of shapes that track cranial movements during a feeding event. And uh, when we uh, align the shapes for this motion, we end up with an ordered progression of head shapes um, or a trajectory. And uh, I'm going to show a number of PC plots during this talk uh, and the data that comprise the indi individual observations or points um, in, in the plot um, are going to change from slide to slide. So I'm going to do my best to be clear about what you're looking at on each. So on this plot, um, you see uh, there's um, observations are head shapes at various stages of a motion. When we uh, align the shapes for a, a motion, we end up with this, this ordered progression of head shapes or trajectory. Um, and here on this plot, the individual points or observations are the head shapes at different stages in the motion. And uh, the point on the left in uh, yellow is the, um, the shape when the mouth is closed at the start of the motion. Uh, the red point at the right is the shape at full gape. Uh, and the points in between uh, are the motion, which progresses from left to right on this plot. And uh, the idea for this approach is that these trajectories contain information um, about the, um, the motions that created them. And so, in other words, we can characterize kinematic differences across a collection of motions uh, using trajectory traits. So, for example, uh, kinesis is a metric uh, describing uh, mobility and can be measured as the sum of procrustes or shape distances between consecutive motion shapes, uh, as you can see illustrated in this idealized trajectory. Um, and I want to quickly um, uh, make a, a note that uh, anytime I show a 2D representation of a trajectory uh, in this talk, um, it's only for visualization. Uh, the actual shape data are, are um, highly uh, um, multidimensional and uh, they're always analyzed in the full n-dimensional space that the data exists in. All right, so um, here's an example from a study um, looking at prey capture and uh, kinematics in uh, African cichlids. Um, each line on this plot um, is one of 326 trajectories for uh, feeding motions um, that were examined in 56 species from uh, Lake Malawi and Tanganyika. Uh, and the largest axis of uh, shape variation, uh, PC1, uh, displays shape change from a closed mouth to a full gape, so, so the, um, the feeding motion. Uh, and you can see that the lengths of the trajectories uh, progressively get longer from the top of the plot down to the bottom, um, representing variation in cranial kinesis. Um, so here, what you see plotted is an average uh, kinesis reconstructed on a phylogeny of the study species. Um, and the species with the highest values in blue uh, have have feeding uh, mecha uh, mechanisms that, um, that produce over two times um, more kinesis than species with the lowest values, um, which are shown in the warmer colors. And so we also see that um, particularly low or high kinesis has appeared to uh, have evolved multiple times across this tree. Um, and then the plot on the right shows the kinesis values just for the living species uh, grouped by dietary category. And this clear pattern emerges where lower kinesis is associated with a slow or non-moving prey and high kinesis with highly mobile prey. Um, and uh, this, uh, this work shows probably not too surprisingly that uh, jaw mobility has evolved along this axis of, of uh, prey mobility within these uh, African lake systems. Um, but this also highlights how a simple trait 
uh, extracted from these trajectories, uh, their length, uh, can tell us uh, something interesting about the diversity and evolution of motions uh, across a group. All right, and I'm gonna, I'm gonna uh, introduce uh, one more trajectory trait today, um, and that's kinematic pattern. Um, this is a little bit more abstract a concept than kinesis. Um, so let's just start with uh, two shapes, uh, one at the beginning of a motion and, and at the end. And so what happens between those two shapes uh, is the motion and precisely where those intermediate points occur, tell us how that motion was achieved. Um, or you can think of that, think of it as the kinematic pattern used to go from start to finish. Um, and so variations in trajectory paths mean that different movement patterns were used. So for example, the motion can take a more circuitous or more direct route, um, or shape change can undergo an abrupt shift and not a gentle transition from one shape to the next. Uh, and even the spacing between the trajectory points can differ. Um, and this occurs when kinesis is concentrated more at one phase of the motion versus another. And so all of these uh, examples that you see on this, on this page um, show differences in trajectory shapes. And uh, if this takes a little while to conceptualize, I totally get it. Um, I mean, we're talking about shapes of trajectories that are themselves composed of shapes. Uh, it's got a real inception-y vibe to it. Uh, but bear with me because I think uh, it's actually a really cool and uh, convenient way to study diversity of, of motion patterns. So I'm going to illustrate uh, variation in kinematic pattern using um, feeding movements in this fish, the six-barred Disticotus. Um, this species is herbivorous and primarily feeds on plants and algae, um, and it, it eats by biting and scraping from the substrate, um, but it can also feed secondarily by suction from the water column. Uh, and here, this fish is doing one of its favorite things, uh, scraping some plant material and, um, and eating it. And so uh, once again, uh, we digitize cranial landmarks. And here's the sample trajectory of the feeding motion for this fish. And uh, you'll notice that it looks much different from the cichlid um, trajectories I showed earlier. Uh, and part of this is because uh, we're capturing both the opening phase of the motion um, from start to full gape, as well as the closing uh, phase from full gape to retraction of the jaw. Um, and now here's a collection of trajectories for over 60 motions in this species. And some of these are for substrate biting and others are for suction feeding. And I know this plot looks like a mess, but we can actually compare the shapes of these trajectories um, by aligning them. And we do this just like we did for the head shapes uh, by scaling, translating, and rotating the trajectories. Um, and the distinction from the alignment that I showed earlier in the talk is that the object of alignment is, um, is not the individual, the individual cranial shapes uh, at different mo motion stages, but the collection of shapes that comprise a motion. And here's proof that this crazy thing that I just described actually works. Uh, this is a PC plot of aligned trajectory shapes. Uh, one of the things that I wanna point out is that there's much more repeatability and similarity across, um, uh, uh, across much of the suction base strikes and relative messiness in the biting motions. Uh, another way to show this variation is in a kinematic morpho space. And here, each point um, is the shape of a, a different trajectory or a different kinematic pattern. And we see a uh, clear separation in uh, this plot between the biting and suction-based motions. And here are the mean shapes for each feeding mode, um, where uh, in the biting strike, there's an abrupt shift in the direction of shape change following a peak gape, uh, where the fish generally makes contact uh, with the substrate but then a smoother transition between opening and closing phases for the suction feeding. Uh, and there's over two times greater variance in biting motions compared with suction. Uh, we attribute this uh, greater diversity to variation in jaw substrate interactions that are absent during suction feeding. So I think it's a really, this is a really powerful approach for detecting and uh, also statistically comparing a uh, mean and variance of kinematic patterns. Uh, so to wrap things up, uh, I hope I've convinced you that this uh, approach is tractable for studying motion diversity um, and that it can be applied to questions at uh, both macroevolutionary scales 
but also comparisons at smaller scales. Um, and I think there's a lot of potential to apply these, uh, these methods to other organisms, different types of motions, and other systems. Uh, and one of the things I didn't have time to talk about today is comparing simulated movements of biomechanical models and placing them in a form function landscape. Um, and I'll be happy to discuss this in more detail later if anyone's interested. And uh, with that, I'll take any questions uh, if there are any. All right, well, if there's no questions right now, I will hand it off to Armida. Sure, let's see if I can get the screen share going. Um, hello, everyone. I just finished my dissertation at Brown University studying this title slide, um, and I'm about to start a postdoc at Yale. So for today, I thought I'd just give you a very quick overview of the methods that I used and developed as a part of my PhD and make a pitch for why joint mobility is interesting and why some of you might want to study it. Um, Traditionally, mobility has been something that human orthopedists have thought about a lot and paleontologists have thought about a lot, but I think there's a great case for studying joint mobility in extant non-human animals as well, and so that's what I'd like to cover today. I will not be joining the workshop next week because of my move, and so I will drop some links in the chat right after this with some links to resources, and you can feel free to email me if you have questions about any of this. Um, I guess Chris and I both did the uh, classic organismal biologist intro slide, so... I don't need to tell you because he just said that there's this amazing diversity of behaviors across the animal kingdom. Um, and so what I'm hoping I can convince you of is that mobility can link the really cool morphological diversity that Aki talked about and the really cool functional diversity that Chris just hit on and give us a way to study that relationship. Um, the reason I think that's useful and the reason I think we need a way to bridge that gap and study it is because form is static. Oftentimes we study the form of just individual tissues like bones and function is this incredible dynamic behavior that's moving through time. And so in order to bridge the gap from form to function, we'd have to make quite a few assumptions. But if we study mobility, which is the range of all poses that a joint can assume, it's kinematic potential, that gives us a more tractable way to study that relationship. Um, I think in this kind of framework, if you want to go straight across from form to function, especially for non-human animals and especially, especially for extinct animals, you oftentimes have to make several assumptions about what the causation is there, even if you can identify a correlation. Um, and in introducing mobility into the mix allows us to say, well, with the shape of the anatomy that you have, what is your kinematic potential? What joint poses could a joint assume? And this is something Mike will touch on in his talk right after mine as well. But I also think mobility allows us to then say, all right, what subset of that kinematic potential do you actually use in life in any given behavior? So in that way, mobility kind of bridges this gap between form and function and gives us a way to study this, which raises the question of how can we study or measure mobility from animals experimentally in the lab or otherwise. Um, traditionally, mobility and, and the way that you might have seen it has been measured by breaking down rotations into three degrees of freedom or three types of rotation. So if you have a bird hip joint, like we have on the slide, you might break it down to flexion, extension, abduction, adduction, and long axis rotation to measure that. Um, I'd like to make the case that this is a thing of the past at this point, and we have plenty of evidence as to why this isn't very biologically informative to study joints this way. So if we think of joint poses, instead of measuring individual rotations in a three-dimensional space, which is something folks have been doing for about a decade now, you can imagine that the first axis of a joint pose space might represent that first motion, flexion extension, moving your thigh bone forward and backward. In the same space, we can think of a second axis being abduction, adduction, moving your thigh bone out to the side from the midline and back in towards the midline. And your third axis might be long axis rotation, twisting that thigh bone. So the reason I bring up this joint pose space framework is because this would suggest that if we did measure those separate individual rotations with protractors or whatever else it has been done for a long time, that would mean that in this pose space, joints can occupy any set of poses in this prism of potential poses, any of these combinations of rotations. The thing is, we know that joints don't actually work this way. Um, their mobility is a subset of that rectangular prism. And so when we think about how we want to measure mobility in a biologically informative way, what we're really trying to capture is this polygonal envelope that has a funky shape and we need to find a way to identify it. So today I'd like to hit on two different but related approaches. One is how to measure mobility from intact cadavers, 
And then that's pretty tricky, pretty expensive, and pretty time consuming. So I'd also like to hit on how to measure mobility from CT derived bone models or photogrammetry derived bone models, what have you. In terms of measuring from intact cadavers, the real way to get this three dimensional mobility to actually get a biologically informed mobility measurement is to use x ray reconstruction of moving morphology. I noted that we had a couple of XROM users in the participants list, so I'm sorry if this is redundant for you. Um, but XROM is a technique that was developed at Brown, co developed by Steve Gatesy and Beth Brainerd, and it involves placing an animal typically a live animal, in the intersection of two x-ray beams. So here we have one x-ray emitter watching our pig eat and a second x-ray emitter watching our pig eat. And from these two x-ray views, we get two high-speed x-ray videos that we're able to use to reconstruct the 3D positions of the pig's bones as it chews. Ultimately, you end up with an animation like this. I understand my chewing pig just became a walking bird, bear with me, but we get these 3D accurate and precise animations of animals moving through space. In order to get to these animations, the actual data flow analysis of XROM is a little tricky, but we have a bigger problem, which is if we don't have a living animal, we need a way to create that moving morphology so we can reconstruct it with X-rays. Um, this is something I've spent quite a lot of time thinking about, and I'd make a big push for using intact cadavers if you're interested in joint mobility. The reason for that is that we want our joints in the context in which they involved, in the context in which they um, are used by the animal. And so essentially you're tying a very long stick to the limb or other joint of your animal and moving it around within the x-ray field to collect data. So you are creating the moving morphology and then measuring it. Then you can go onto the computer screen and digitally isolate any given joint, but at least you're getting that joint within its intact context without affecting the function of the joint with your manipulation. Ultimately, XROM yields these biplanar X-ray videos in which the data analysis involves tracking individual radiopaque markers in the two views. This is incredibly time consuming, especially for mobility work, um, because of the sheer number of poses that you need to analyze to get a good sense of the full range of motion, especially if you're interested in the coordination among multiple joints, it requires tens of thousands or hundreds of thousands of joint poses. Unfortunately, we've talked to the developers of Deep Lab Cut, we've published a paper on it. The, computer vision methods that are available right now just don't do this very well for mobility work in particular because it's so acyclical. So it will involve quite a bit of manual tracking, but it's doable. Plenty of lab groups have done it at this point. That said, because it is pretty time consuming, out of all the different XROM studies that have been done, by the end of 2020, only these taxonomic groups shaded in gray were hit with XROM mobility studies. And so I'd really like to advocate for people, especially people already involved in XROM work, to consider doing these mobility studies as well, because it's as we build up this comparative data set that'll become even more useful. Let's say you measure your XROM data. Here's what your analysis is going to look like. For any given joint pose, if the animal is posed and within the X-ray beams, that would correspond to a single pose in joint pose space. And so as the animal is manipulated within the X-ray beams and the data are analyzed, you get a series of poses in pose space, which ultimately at the end of a full manipulation correspond to a pose cloud. And then we can go ahead and shrink wrap that pose cloud to make it more simple. But this represents the joint's mobility in space. And so the whole goal of this XROM analysis would be to get the cadaveric mobility of a given joint in an animal. Why is that useful? Well, you can make attempts to tie it to the form of the joint, and Michael hit on that a bit. But I'd also like to say that you can tie it to the function that you're actually observing in life. And so the real benefit of doing this in an XROM framework is to measure true in vivo joint poses and you can understand the relationship between those in vivo poses and the full kinematic potential of the cadaveric mobility. Um, it's not actually that simple. There's some details to how to graph that, but I promise it's not hard. If you took trigonometry in high school, you can do the transformation necessary to graph them properly. Um, I'm happy to talk about that more later. The benefit of this is that you can really start to understand how true in vivo joint poses correspond to kinematic potential. So, as an example, we've done this for archosaur hind limb joints, bird and alligator hind limb joints, and found these really cool patterns that relate locomotor poses to full potential joint mobility in these animals. And so this is why I wanna advocate for the building up of these mobility data sets across a broader taxonomic range. We can't do these kinds of comparative analyses until we have mobility data for a ton of joints. Um, and I think that can be super valuable. If you're interested in doing this, I have a whole protocol paper published and I'll drop a link in the chat. It's open access and it walks you through all the steps, things like how to manipulate the limbs, how to implant markers in the bones, how to set up an x-ray system, all that's covered. And so I think it's a pretty clear step-by-step -step guide. 
That said, XROM is expensive and accessible, and I understand that. So let's say you just have CT-derived bone models, either you don't have access to XROM or your animal is a rare or endangered animal, or you're working with an extinct animal, all you have to work with are bones. So what can you do there? Essentially, if we go back to our 3D joint post space, what you would like to do is figure out what subset of this joint post space seems to be allowed by the bones, which ones of these joint poses are part of the joint's mobility. So what you're really trying to do is to sample the space in a gridded way. And then once you build up that grid, you're trying to decide which subset of these poses, these points appear possible. Now you could look at all those one by one, but if you grid joint pose space at five degrees, that's already about 200,000, 300,000 poses. So wouldn't really want to identify those one by one. So what I've done is I've developed a method where you can go through that automatically. I took a method from computer animation. So if you've seen a Pixar movie, you've seen a character move around, Sully or Nemo, what have you, those characters are all rigged using these animation joints. And so I've written code where you can rotate that joint through a systematic combination of rotations, get an exhaustive sampling of post space. There are benefits for wanting to do that exhaustively, and I'm happy to talk about that more later. But essentially, you can get the computer to automatically tell you, hey, at this joint pose, those bones are inside of each other. That's not a viable joint pose. You shouldn't include it in your mobility. And so this is something that can be left to run on the computer quite simply, and you can get an analysis of joint mobility that way. So from this full gridded sample of pose space, you can then get down to here are the poses that actually appear possible based on those bones alone. Why would you ever want to do this? Well, paleontologists have a ton of interest in this, but I'll hit on a couple of other applications. This is the paleontological application. We could say, for example, hey, this potential pose that paleontologists are interested in is outside of the joint's mobility. That means the animal couldn't have used it in life. That's something you could, of course, do with a living animal as well. We can, this is only looking at rotations. We could also consider things like what is the effect of joint translation on mobility. That's code that I've also automated that I can link to to get at that kind of analysis. There have been these really cool papers um, in JEB in recent years, and a couple of other groups have picked up on it, experimentally modifying morphology and seeing what the effects of adding or removing different processes are on joint mobility. So truly making a change to the form and looking at the effect of that on mobility and inferring the effect on function. That's something that could easily be done um, virtually, though some groups have done it with 3D printing and other techniques. Some groups have built other constraints on top of this. So the group at Harvard did some really cool work thinking about joint strain, adding other constraints virtually to mobility and running an analysis seeing, hey, what if we assume that our bones can only move a certain distance apart? What would that do to joint mobility? And I've also done some work modeling ligaments and other soft tissues as well. So basic mobility analyses are really easy to get running in Autodesk Maya, which is free to anyone with a .edu email address. And then you can kind of elaborate on that and build on top of that, depending on what your questions are. Um, all the code I've tried to make really accessible for other people to pick up on this and adopt. So I'll drop the link into this in the XROM repository, which if you've done any XROM you're familiar with, we've added an other MEL scripts repository where I have this joint mobility subset with all of the scripts to set up um, a digital puppet to get your joint mobility work working, automate it through, add different parameters into it. And so if you're interested in adopting any of this, please do reach out to me. I'm happy to show you how any of that works. I hope I've given you a quick 10, 15 minute overview of how mobility can link form to function, why you might want to study that. And Mike will cover that in a different way shortly, but do feel free to reach out to me and I'm happy to chat if you want to get started on any of those kinds of projects. All right, I think I talked for too long, so I'll take questions at the end, but I will pass it off to Mike, who will also talk about joints and form and function. Thanks, Armina. Okay, let's see. Okay, uh, hopefully you can see my screen. All right, so um, so I'm going to talk about uh, so so just as a I guess my disclaimer is we're, my lab is mostly focused on understanding kind of uh, within human variability, um, but we have done some comparative work looking at uh, non-human primates and things like that. And so um, <clears throat> so I'm going to go through kind of three approaches that we've used um, and and talk about kind of the strengths and limitations of of each one. Um, but I think all three are powerful tools um, for understanding form function relationships. So the first one is just simply, or not maybe so simply, but correlating shape with range of motion measures. 
Um, the second one is looking at things at the joint level and describing um, the kinematics in what uh, at least we feel is a, um, a nicely interpretable metric, which is the functional axis of rotation. And then using a geometric primitive to kind of bridge the gap between um, analyzing the functional axis and understanding what the shape analysis is giving us. And then the final one is then using a musculoskeletal model in the loop to um, really use shape as an independent variable so we can kind of get our heads around uh, some cause effect relationships. Okay, so the first project I'm gonna kind of, I'll use this project to illustrate the correlating shape to range of motion um, is in the human wrist. And so the bone we're focusing on here is the scaphoid. And the scaphoid is a, uh, so the wrist facilitates motion between your hand and your forearm. Uh, and the scaphoid kind of bridges the two rows in the wrist. And it's um, pretty unique because it's mostly passive. There's a very tiny muscle insertion on the distal end, but it's mostly driven by just the ligaments and the cartilage. And that'll become important in a minute. So in this study, we looked at 10 volunteers, which were taken from a larger pool of, um, of uh, lots more subjects where we measured their, what we called laxity. So we measured their range, passive range of motion. And then we picked people that had really hardly any range of motion, but still not pathological all the way to people that had an extreme range of motion. And then we CT scan those people in different wrist positions. And so we, that's where we got our kind of range of motion measure. So then we did um, our principal components analysis. So um, that was covered in uh, Aki, uh, Chris and Armida's talk is this uh, procrusty scaling and things like that. The um, one thing we did that was different was we used a coherent point drift method, which does the entire mesh. It does um, landmarking across the entire mesh rather than kind of discrete landmarks. Um, a strength of that is that it'll allow, it allows us later to kind of morph our soft tissue models around. A limitation is that it's a lot less precise than the um, landmarking that you saw in there in uh, Chris and Aki's talk. So the coherent point drift basically sets up a um, correspondence across all the meshes so that, so for example, if you have 10,000 points in your mesh, 0.7005 is the same across all your kind of samples. And then we can run PCA on that. And so we did that for the scaphoid and ran our, our principal components analysis. So then we got these principal component, uh, first two principal components uh, explained for about 42% of the variability. And these are what the shapes look like deviating from the mean shape. One thing we wrestle with in our group that I'd love to discuss later is that one of the things that we kind of wrestle with is um, uh, quali we have to kind of qualitative, qualitatively um, describe these sophisticated shape changes. Oh, and, or we have to kind of fall back to discrete measures to say, oh, what's happening with this PC mode? Oh, this, this, and this. Um, so that's something that we do. But we also then correlated its range of motion. So here we have um, on the x-axis principal component one, which is you're seeing on the right. And then on the y-axis, we have the amount of passive flexion across individuals. And we had a pretty strong correlation, especially for an in vivo uh, data, data set. And so this was PC1 with passive flexion. What was interesting in this study is that we also got uh, principal component two, which had a different suite of uh, shape features changing, was strongly correlated with passive extension. So that makes me think there's kind of two different mechanisms of dictating either uh, flexion range of motion or extension range of motion. So here's kind of a summary of what the shape changes look like and whether you have a higher or low range of motion. So, so that's the one, one approach. And some of the limitations of this approach is that we really don't know. So we started the study thinking that it was all ligament laxity. That's what we call it all along. Then we did the shape analysis on the joints and realized that the joints are changing shape and that's also con contributing to the range of motion. But since it's a correlative study, we really don't know if uh, the shapes are changing at the same time ligament properties are changing and those two things changing together and, and, and creating this range of motion. Or is it also controlling what kind of postures the joints can achieve in, say, a neutral wrist position? 
So we really don't know how to untangle that without doing kind of a more sophisticated um, musculoskeletal model where we actually model the ligaments and the contacts and try to really figure out um, what's causing what here. So going down kind of, I guess, one level is doing this more, um, this joint level analysis. So the metric that we like to look at for joint level analysis is what we call the, it's called the helical axis of motion. And so what it is, is um, a, a good analogy to think of it is if you think of a teeter totter and the seats in the yellow bar represent a rigid body. If we put markers on that and tracked it through space in 3D, and calculated the helical axis moving from one frame to the next or over a wide range of frames, the rotation axis or the, the helical axis would go right through the shaft here, right through the, um, the pivot point of the teeter-totter. So if you bring this back to like some anatomy, this is a foot going from initial contact to full arch deformation. So when your foot flattens on the ground and what we're looking at is the metatarsal here moving from um, contact to full loading relative to the calcaneus and we're computing the helical axis here you can see it's kind of going into the page there so the way to interpret that is you wrap your hand around the axis kind of visualize it point your thumb in the direction of the axis and then turn your hand and that's the way the the joint would be moving so some just kind of as an example of a way you can use this to analyze data um, and this is a wrist moving through a, a dart, what's called a dart throwing range of motion. The capitate and the hamate essentially move as rigid bodies, and that's kind of reflected in the helical axis here. So it's moving from frame to frame, it's moving around a little bit, but those two axes are coincident, whereas the triquetrum here, which is moving, kind of getting controlled by both the lunate here and the hamate, that axis of rotation changes and moves all around. So, um, and there's lots of things you can do with these axes, but they're very kind of intuitive once you get the hang of looking at them. So just to formalize that, a helical axis is a change in position and orientation of a rigid body. And you can describe that fully by defining an axis in space about which the body rotates around and translates along. And then the other parameter is uh, this Q here is a location for the axis. So it can be, any point on the axis that defines it. Okay, so that's the helical axis. Um, just to show you an example of how we can use it, this is um, XROM data of the foot, at, and uh, Armita did an amazing job kind of uh, explaining how XROM works. I'm sure most people are familiar. So these are our foot, foot bones. And what we were interested in is the ankle joint complex. So the heel, the calcaneus, the talus, and the tibia moving relative to each other. So what we did was we took um, from, we did a kind of a big step. So one thing about the helical axis is it's sensitive to noise. So if you do really small frame by frame differences, it can get unstable. So we did a kind of a big step from initial contact to full loading. So that's what this gray bone is here, the gray calcaneus moving toward the teal one. Same with the talus, it's hard to see, but it's moving uh, inside the socket of the, uh, of the tibia. And then we'll focus on this tibia talus axis here. So this is the functional axis or the helical axis of the talus as it moves through that range of motion. And you can, if you look at the joint shape, so here we're trying to now relate that to the shape of the joints and how that controls where this axis is. You can think of the Taylor dome as almost like a cylinder. And so before I get into that though, just to explain a little bit about the, um, what you can do just with the kinematics analysis, is in this case, we looked at the calcaneus relative to the tibia, that defines the full ankle complex. We computed that rotation axis. Then we computed the talus relative to the tibia, and that's what's called the talopural joint. And then we can look at the distribution across the different planes of motion. So this is a sagittal plane motion. And we can kind of figure out which joint is contributing in which way to the overall motion. So then to get that back to the shape, what we started with is we have a cylinder here and a cylinder is an oversimplification of the complex Taylor anatomy, but we need a way to kind of talk about it. Um, and so what we did was we fit a cylinder to the Taylor dome. So that's this articular surface of the talus. And that's what this teal axis is here. And then we compared it to our functional axis. So you can see in 
the coronal plane that um, agrees really well, but then in the sag in the transverse plane, so looking down at the top, we've got a little bit of a problem, a difference here. And it's a small amount of degrees in terms of range of motion, but it's there and it's consistent. So it helps us kind of understand how good or bad our, our cylinder analogy is for the Taylor dome. But the reason why we like a cylinder or something like it is because instead of just, uh, not just, it's still important to do these correlations with the PC scores and the rotation axis, but this kind of gives us a little bit of insight into, into the function. So if we look at the principal component one of the talus um, and see how that affects the cylinder, we can now kind of use the shape, uh, statistical shape model as an independent variable, see how that affects the cylinder radius, which will change where that axis is in space. So principal component one didn't really do anything. I didn't show it, but uh, the size of the overall size of the talus, as you might expect, explains somewhere around 50 or 60% of the variation. And then principal component two explained another about 50% of the variation in this cylinder axis. So um, PC1 changed other features of, of the talus, not necessarily the curvature of the Taylor dome. And that, since we already did the work to figure out how that relates to the functional axis, we can kind of make inference, inferences about how, how the changes in shape are relating to changes in function. So the strengths of this approach is that shape and size can be independent variable for geometric uh, primitives. If you believe the primitive is a good analogy to your functional axes, then you can infer form function relationships. Um, a limitation is that uh, they don't capture the full complexity of the joint. And then the other limitation I'm gonna talk about next is that this is all kinematics and that doesn't say anything about uh, the joint contact forces, ligament and muscle forces that are happening as, you ch as a, a consequence of different shapes. So that's a quick thing I'm gonna finish up with is um, this approach that we, we've been working on and others have, worked, have also published in this area where we look at, um, we do a statistical shape model, but instead of doing it on the entire, on a, a single bone, we usually, we run it on the entire joint. And what that, that, and if we use a coherent point drift method, what that allows us to do is Number one, the principal component modes maintain congruence in the joint. So as you change the shape of the femur, you're also changing the shape of the patella here. We can then plug that into a musculoskeletal model, and that allows us to use either kinematics or shape as our independent variable or, or a combination of the two. So just to kind of show you how that works, um, we this is where the coherent point drift is helpful. Um, what we can do is we have a musculoskeletal model that has a kind of a template bone mesh associated with it. We can then morph the model using our principal components uh, shape analysis and warp the soft tissues along with it. Um, the musculoskeletal model we're using was developed by Daryl Thalen, and I believe it's available on OpenSim um, on SimTK. It's called the COMAC algorithm. And what it does is it um, optimizes for uh, muscle energy, but also for joint congruence simultaneously. So what you can do is most of the joints are constrained, but the knee is a full, we call, call it a 12 degree of freedom joint because you have six degrees of freedom at the patellofemoral joint, six degrees of freedom at the tibiofemoral joint, and it's constrained by the soft tissues, so the cartilage, the ligaments, and the muscles. So we can then morph these models around, plug them into the musculoskeletal model and get our kinematic and kinetic outputs. So I'll just walk you through a couple of uh, results to show you what that means. And, and, and for this study, we only used a single gate trial, which I know is a bit problematic and that's something we're working on as well. But just to kind of show you, this is the gate cycle on the x-axis. And then the shape changes are going from blue to red. So the blue shape, you actually, if we're looking down at the femur, have kind of a flat trochlear groove. And so the patella can, has a lot of move, can move a lot. Whereas the red shape uh, captured a kind of a very steep groove. And so if you vary, um, vary that and then plug it all into the same kinematic trial, uh, this is the resulting patellar tilt. So the patella is tilting laterally 
uh, negative. So that means that if you have a flatter groove, you get more negative lateral tilt or more lateral tilt. Likewise, if you have a flatter groove, you get more lateral translation on the patella. And then when you look at contact forces, I thought this was a pretty interesting graph because it shows that if you look at the peak patella, uh, patellofemoral contact force, the flatter grooves have the highest, the mean shape has the lowest. And then you still get, as you go more toward three standard deviations of the deeper groove, it does go up, but not nearly as dramatically as for the flatter grooves. So this kind of helps us understand the full range of how um, shape can alter uh, function. And again, not the full range because we still need to do more with it, some of the kinematics. So the strengths of this approach is that um, you can tr treat shape and kinematics truly as independent variables. Um, so you can investigate really, you can actually isolate cause and effect. Um, and it helps kind of, you can also use these models to kind of bound what's possible. Like, so uh, what, what Armida was uh, pointing out with the, um, the kinematic, the available kinematics of range of motion, you can do a similar thing with these models where you vary all these things and get kind of a band of, this is what's reasonable. Um, a limitation of it is it's kind of hard. You can't still isolate specific features of the bone. So that's why some of the work Armida referred to where they're actually changing specific features and doing some analysis is really important. So for us, for example, our PCs move the whole joint around. So we can never say with certainty that it's one specific feature that's causing the changes we see. Um, finally, anytime you add complexity like this, so complexity in the model, you're also embedding assumptions and some more uncertainty. So for example, we don't know if this cost function, which was validated in humans applies if you started extending this across primates and things like that, or if it even works the same in humans at all times. Um, we also don't know, for example, if the muscles and ligaments morph exactly the way the shapes morph, they may move around relative to that, to that warping that we're accounting for. So those are kind of the, the tools that we're, we're using that I wanted to show here today. In the workshop, I'll go through how to um, compute the helical axis and put it in coordinate systems and visualize it and things like that. So with that, I'd like to thank you. And then uh, I'll take any questions. And I think we'll probably move on to the um, panel discussion. All right, thanks, Mike. I think we're, um, I think we're kind of over time for, for questions, but let's um, just revisit that at the um, the panel discussion. So um, what I think I'm going to do is uh, give everyone a little bit of a break to stretch and maybe refresh their coffee. So let's um, come back in like uh, in five minutes. All right, we'll go ahead and uh, and continue things. Um, so. Uh, to get things going uh, and to give people a little bit of time to uh, to think about questions, I see that we already have a couple uh, in the Q and A. But uh, let's uh, I'm going to start this uh, discussion by um, asking a, a question that I'd like all the speakers to to answer. And so, um, and I'll start I'll start uh, with my answer. But what are the current challenges in your field of study and what are some maybe future directions you see uh, your work going? Um, and so, uh, for mine, I think I think one of the biggest things is is to use these concepts um, that are developed um, very you know have been developed for a couple of decades now for geometric morphometrics, um, mostly for static morphology, uh, and to figure out how how those concepts apply to um, to moving morphologies. What you know. Um, what things like the shape of shape of a motion trajectory mean in terms of a moving animal, and what are the implications it has for um, for how it can com complete some some sort of task? So I think that's one of the biggest things that's kind of that, that's that's um, uh, kind of uh, the hurdle to to get over, I guess, when we're when we're trying to develop some of these uh, some of these new methods. Um, and uh, and as far as like future directions that we have, um, I think you know the the same type of analyses that that we can track motion um, over time. Uh, you can also track any any type of morphological change through time, um, and it doesn't have to be a um, 
uh, anatomical landmarks in a, uh, within an individual. So you can imagine um, using the same type of analysis and interpretations to study developmental series um, or evolutionary trajectories. Um, and uh, there's also possibility to instead of instead of like I said anatomical landmarks on a uh, fish's skull, you can you can do something like uh, each landmark is an individual uh, uh, is an individual animal, and that you track through space and time. So uh, there's a lot of really cool ways I think that we can apply these sorts of uh, methods that I that I talked about today to uh, to a really wide range of uh, questions and systems. Um, and I think we'll just go, I'll, I'll pass that my question along about the challenges and future directions um, in the order of the talks. Um, so uh, Aki, I'll let you go first. Yeah, sure. sure. Um, so when I think of like challenges, I, I guess I, my thought goes to like, what are bottlenecks? <laughs> um, so, you know, at least like in my research and I'm sure it happens to most, if not all of you is like, I think like how we process, for example, CT segmentation, that, that tends to be a bottleneck. And I know there are, you know, um, deep learning um, approaches now for, you know, kind of automated, automated or at least semi-automated methods. Um, so that might be fixed or resolved uh, mostly in, in a little while. Um, but also like for, for my stuff with high density shape data, like it's, it's a lot of time that goes into collecting um, the type of data that that I do for my research. Um, so yeah, kind of a automated method or at least more automated method for doing that would be good. And there are certainly methods. Um, there, there are landmark free methods. Um, and I think, yeah, these are things that pro will probably get remarkably better in the next 10 years or so, you know, even five years. Um, another kind of methodological limitation though is like, I, well, at least, what I do, and I think what's typical for modeling, like how we model at least um, uh, like how shape changes based on some factors is mostly done through like linear formulas, right? So like, yeah, a lot of things in biology are, are linear, but a lot of things are not. So, um, you know, like processes like motion or, or even development, you know, it's, I, I think those are complex, um, yeah, processes that probably will require, you know, more complex models and, and hopefully like, yeah, in the near future, we can kind of move and focus towards beyond, going beyond just kind of linear modeling. And I guess I'll pass it off to Armida. I guess I'm next. Um... A ton of things. There's definitely the time factor that Aki brings up for everything, but everything that's been brought up so far, I think you have a trade off where you're sacrificing accuracy or precision or both to save time in our field. And so I think trying to come up with time saving approaches that don't have that trade off will be a big benefit. But conceptually, I think a really big issue is trying to find principles and methods for studying joint function that apply across different joint types and different kinds of animals. Um, so I think studying intervertebral joints is in some ways really fundamentally different from studying limb joints, which is really different than studying those crazy fish skull joints. Um, and there are some things we're identifying where you can apply similar approaches across all of those things, but in other cases, you can kind of specialize for what you're looking at. So trying to determine when it makes sense to come up with a solution that works for everything. Whereas when you need to specialize in for a certain joint, like some of the things that Mike talked about work really well for small, small shape variations within a specific type of human joint, but you would be able to apply that same kind of an approach to a bird joint versus an alligator joint versus a lizard joint, because the differences are just so, so. I think trying to target different scales of variation and different temporal and evolutionary scales is a big thing moving forward. Mike. Um, yeah, I guess I think scientific. One thing I think about a lot is um, when you do compare either even within joints or across. Like a lot of the metrics are ge geometric, like uh, dice coefficients and RMS errors and things like that. But it's hard to know what those mean. I guess in terms of function. So you know, and, and there's like an anecdotal thing that's in the human literature that the shoulder is more variable than the knee. But I don't know what that actually means because, you know, a small 
one millimeter change in the shoulder might have a huge difference in function versus there may be things that can change a lot versus something that can change a little. I, I don't think we have, it's hard to get your head around all that stuff. And then on the practical side, it's like Aki said, the bottleneck for, for us is, um, you know, we can get lots of scans and get pretty decently sized shape atlases now, but our functional measures are limited by the technology. So getting 10 subjects and doing a foot in the XROM takes us like at least a year, probably more to analyze um, at, at, at right now until the software gets better. All right, so it looks like we have uh, we have two questions in the q and I think both are probably suited for for Mike, but I'm, I'll uh, go ahead and read them off. So, uh, uh, Jasmine, Chris, uh, oh, uh, oh well, yeah. there was a question that was um, asked in the Q and A, like oh, yeah. before the cutoff. I mean, totally. It, yeah, yeah. Please, yeah. Go for to, it. I wonder if yeah, if that takes precedence. So yeah, the question was um, about you know how do we come up with a, a landmark scheme, and and so I I answered first part of it, and then got cut off. This session got cut off. But okay, so the, but I'll start from the beginning, which is like you know I think in general. I mean, geometric morph metrics and shape analysis is a tool. So, you know, what I tend to say is like, you know, you can misuse or use the tools to your you know, benefit, you know? So um, your biological question that you're trying to answer should inform, you know, what kind of, how you're gonna use a tool like geometric morph metrics. So I, it's definitely worth thinking a lot about landmark scheme. Um, and so in like the general rules are that you know, you, you should have a good coverage of the structure of interest. And then that the landmark should probably cover, you know, more or less evenly so that, so that you're not like over weighting certain areas of that structure. Um, and then I'll put this in the chat, but yeah, I'll also publish um, a little kind of computational tool for assessing whether you like sampled enough landmarks. Um, so if you're worried about like, are my, is my set of landmarks, is that adequately capturing the shape variation? Like, so I, I made a, like an R package to, to kind of test for that. So I'll post that very soon. But um, yeah, I mean, I think, um, yeah, so, so those are kind of the general rules. Um, and uh, if you have any other additional questions or, you know, more specific questions, feel free to, you know, post them on in the Q&A session. And I'll, I'll add to, to Aki's answer um, because my application of morph metrics is, is slightly different. So what, uh, for me, what I had to do was to, uh, to think about which are the kind of components of the motion that I'm interested in capturing and, and how I can use the landmarks to, to, um, to make sure that I'm getting those movements included in the shape variation. So, so I started to think about things that we typically know to vary you know, in fish feeding motions like maxillary rotation, premaxillary protrusion, and all these different the suite of traits. And I made sure that my my landmarks were were capturing those those aspects of, of movement. So so yeah, like Aki said, different applications, different um, questions will require kind of different approaches and strategies for for choosing landmarks. Um, all right, so so we'll go to the questions from uh, Jasmine, and so she asked. Uh, so this workshop presents interesting possibilities of integrating workflows into a more holistic understanding of form and function. Um, this is the first I've heard of coherent point drift. Can anyone point me to learning resources? So Mike, that might be something you can type in, but uh, also something that you can possibly address in words. Yeah, sure. I, I guess I'll start and maybe you can, you, you, you can try, you two can chime in or three. Um, so my understanding is, so coherent point drift, I just posted the, the reference and we have code um, that we've implemented on a GPU. So it actually runs quite fast um, and we can make that available. Um, but I think it's just messier. So like if you ran it on some of the skulls that Aki showed in his talk, I think it wouldn't really work too well. So one example where it really does a bad job is um, the subtalar joint has kind of some people have two um, joint articulations like separate joint and some people have a really smooth continuous one and it really doesn't do a good job whereas I think you might need a person to intervene there um, so we've done it 
kind of hybrid methods, especially with the scapula, which is a lot more complex. So if you run, we run coherent point drift, we do landmarking to do our shape analysis, and then we do thin plate spl splines and coherent point drift those to map the models over. But when we try to do shape analysis on the point drift, it's messier. And so uh, you get, it's just, it slides the landmarks around in ways you probably wouldn't want if you're doing something really precise. Hopefully that makes sense. Uh, this, this isn't something I've actually used very much, uh, Mike, but I wonder, do, is the is the kind of point of the uh, this coherent point drift, does it um, allow for, for you not to worry about homology quite as much as you do with uh, with landmark based morphometrics is it kind of you, you know a lot like the movement of the uh, of the uh, the points uh, kind of accommodate that or, or yeah what's the what's the benefit to using that versus like a well so it does kind of like the, the classic procrustes and then adds on a um deformation like a, it'll register it'll deform the meshes into each other and use like a minimum energy type idea to to figure out the correspondences um so somebody had asked said it was mesh dependent and that's very true. So one of the ways we get around that is once we run it through two passes and once we get a mean mesh we're happy with, we'll upsample all the other bones that get fit to the mean mesh so that it's not jumping around on landmarks and that gives us a, a better kind of fit. But it works really well on some bones and really terrible on others. So like, oh, can I ask a, question yeah yeah please <laughs> so one I have thing a I, later too <laughs> i think about is uh what this stuff is um like the unit of so like i showed the stuff with um running pca on the entire joint because otherwise you have three different bones and how do you know which ones to put together so like we didn't really have any other choice but then we also talk about sometimes doing like specific analyses on just one joint articular surface and doing shape analysis on that versus the bone, do you have thoughts on like, which one, like, you know, is it appropriate to pick all those as your kind of units of shape analysis or is it like, cause in the, you know, the green book, it's always one bone is the unit that you want to work on. I don't know if that makes sense. So you got kind of, are you asking me or Chris? Um... I'm asking anyone who wants to say something. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so so yeah, um, yeah. In terms of like, you know, what what are the what I what do you pick for? Yeah, like units of and structure that you actually want to capture, especially yeah. at like the at joint interface, right? Um, well, okay. So in terms of like, just purely from kind of the um, methodological point of view, um, there are packages um, now. Uh, what's it called? Like Shape Rotator, and I and it's implemented in R where you can have um, at least two, it's probably two or more, but yeah, you can, for example, I think the example they used was like a skull and a mandible, right? And then you can kind of select the axis of rotation. And I don't know how complex you can set up that, you know, degrees of freedom, but at that joint, but yeah, it allows you to add like kind of movement around that joint as part of that procrustes alignment. So that helps you incorporate multiple bones that are able to move, you know, somewhat independently from one another. Yeah. So if there's um, no other questions right now, I have a quick question for Mike. And Mike, maybe I, I misunderstood something you were saying, but just, just to get back to some, uh, so you, I think there was a point where you mentioned that you did the a, a PCA and PC1, while accounting for most of the variation, wasn't necessarily functionally relevant for the either either functionally relevant or or as, or uh, relevant to the thing that you were interested in capturing. Um, and I think that's like I think that's a pretty important uh, thing to recognize is that sometimes just because you have something varies a lot doesn't necessarily mean that it's functional you know functionally important. There are some things that don't vary so much. And have much that are much more controlled or much more constrained in their in their variation, um, but the but 
changes in them have really important functional consequences. We see that we see that in um, you know some biomechanical models uh, um, and things like that. So I'm wondering if that's something that you come across like often that sort of thing, or or is this just kind of like a one one off situation that you that you were that you encountered? Um, no, we have come across it a couple times now. So in the shoulder, PC4 was really strongly correlated, separated people that got rotator cuff tears from healthy people. And so did PC2. And then one and three didn't have any relationship. And so the way we reasoned, and I, actually it would be interesting to see what you think about this, but we reasoned that, like you said, it's a, it's a maybe a subtle change like geometrically, but it has a pretty big function, functional consequence. Yeah, that's, that's, some, that's something that's come across, I think, um, in the context of like uh, four bar linkages um, in, in like fish jaws. Uh, uh, some, wor some work by Martha Munoz at, uh, at Yale has, has kind of looked at that and also the influence and the relative variation and uh, impact uh, on rates of evolution actually. Um, so, so yeah, this is a kind of, I think a reoccurring thing, theme in that, um, in that, yes, function, uh, functional uh, importance is not necessarily always aligned with kind of variation that we, that we see in our data. Um, so let's see, we got an, uh, another question from uh, Jasmine. Uh, I wonder how this differs from auto 3D geometric morphometrics, a predefined number of pseudo landmarks versus points in a polygon or mesh. I guess, uh, um, Mike, that's probably in relation to the coherent point drift, I'm guessing. Yeah, I'm not, I have, I'm not familiar with auto 3 AGM, so I heard from you. Oh, I mean, I guess I can answer, try to answer that at least. Um, yeah, auto 3D GM is where you like specify the number of like equidistant um, landmarks that you wanna put on like a mesh model. Um, yeah, I mean, I think it would be pretty equivalent if you have like same, like, what is it? Like the equal distribution of polygons throughout your mesh. Um, but yeah, I mean, I, I assume it's it's similar. Those are two tools that you can use if, if your structure is like very, does not have a lot of features. Um, so, it, it, it could it would probably I assume would give you fairly comparable results, but at the same time, um, because it's featureless, I know there there have been problems with trying to align correctly. Um, so, for example, you can maybe think of like a tube or like a limb bone, right? And it might confuse which side is proximal and distal when it's going through alignment programs, and especially if you're sampling across wide like taxonomic scope. Um, so that's something you need to like make sure is that it's, it's aligning properly and it's interpreting the the areas of, of that structure correctly. Um, I see uh, Monica's question. Yeah, I just saw that. So uh, let's see. I'll, I'll go ahead and read read that. Um, are you or others currently working on methods to directly relate variation in joint morphology and mobility to variation in muscle anatomy? Um, specifically, I'm curious about how the relationship between joints and muscles might influence the accessible, accessible function action space for muscles that might otherwise appear to be the same or similar. Um, I'll, I, I can chime in, but uh, other, my, basically, my answer to that is is I'd love to include muscle uh, muscle uh, into my you know my analyses. Uh, for my stuff, the visualization is the part that uh, that limits that. But I'm sure others have some more nuanced answers. No, I mean, did I, I think that'd be fantastic. I think it gets really hard, especially if you're studying non-human animals where the muscle anatomy isn't super well understood or hasn't been modeled, but the number of musculoskeletal models is definitely increasing. So yeah, we should do yeah, that. I'm, yeah, I'm approaching it like, so this is super preliminary, but um, so no, no, no posting on social media. <laughs> um, but uh, yeah, I'm, what, what I'm trying to do is, yeah, like right now my current project looks at like brain and skull interplay, but I want to add muscles to that, like cranial muscles. And so 
I started, don't have any useful data yet, but like artificially um, uh, paralyzing cranial muscles during development of a thick embryo. And then basically seeing, you know, how and quantifying um, um, the, yeah, muscle, various very uh, variables metrics associated with muscles so this could be you know a cross-sectional area or uh, we have edwin dickinson as our postdoc so he's, he's kind of a pro at doing the uh, fascicle muscle fascicle reconstructions and, and and then seeing you know how are you know muscles uh and metrics related to muscles associated with skull shape um but again this is super preliminary and, and obviously i'm not the first one to start doing that um, but hoping to use, yeah, some of the modern techniques to, to investigate this. Yeah, we've only got, a, we've looked at some moment arm changes and lines of action and things like that, but yeah, I would love to get into more detailed like muscle architecture. Yeah, most of, the, I'll add that most of the stuff that I've done that integrates muscles is qualitative. It's like, you know, here are the movements and then here's what we think the muscles are doing. So I'd love, I'd also love to, have a, a way to uh, to uh, quantitatively integrate muscles into uh, into the movements I'm capturing. Um, all right. Well, I think I don't see any more questions, um, but I think we've had a good discussion, and I really appreciate all of the uh, speakers for for their talks. Um, I thought they were really that they're all really awesome, and again, very very diverse um, set of topics uh, within morphology and functional. Um, realm. So um, I guess I will leave it there and, uh, and thank you all of the uh, um, people watching for, for visiting and, and for sticking around. Um, and I'll see you later.